everybody, and welcome to another awesome, uplifting, encouraging, strengthening episode of Ignite Radio Live. You are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio for the Almighty, we proclaim. And we invite you to join us on this great adventure mm-hmm. at I Love My Family. Dot US. What can they expect to find there at I Love My Family. US? Um, really, the heart and soul of it is mm. this thing, this instrument of grace called yeah. the Live It Gathering Guide. It's meaning Image Trinity. So it's a way to um, for families to come together mm-hmm. to talk and pray, and this kind of guides them along it using family fun questions and um, the upcoming Sunday readings and some different reflection questions that go with that. Before we welcome our awesome uh, guest tonight, Father Eric Schild, Steph, tell us a little bit about our Lenten Power Hour series for Catholic couples. So we are so excited to launch this as a Lenten opportunity for Catholic couples. It can be an awesome date night every Wednesday during Lent. It begins at 8.30 with a featured speaker and for about 20 minutes a talk by them and then breaking out into small groups to talk about um, what was just given to us and to actually use some of the uh, awesomeness, as I said, (laughs) of the Lit Gathering Guide, which can also be used not just in families, but in Mm. small groups and such. Um, Some of the speakers that we have lined up are Greg and Julie Alexander from the Alexander House, a beautiful marriage ministry. Father Nathan Cromley, a hometown family favorites, Peter and Debbie Herbeck, who just bless this area so much, Melody Lyons, who's really making an impact in the Catholic world, Father Nick Rowell, an amazing retreat master from Pennsylvania, and the beloved Dr. Bob Schutz from the John Paul II Healing Center. We're going to pour a glass of wine or whatever your Lenten commitment allows you at 8.30 every Wednesday, where you can register and you need to register at massimpact.us forward slash power. That's massimpact.us forward slash power. Power. And by the way, the registration for the next Belief and Beverage Night, which is St. Patty's Day. I don't have a very good bro that was at all. Fun. Really? Yeah. St. Patty's Day, March 17th. Um, same bat time, same bat place. Conan Auto Family, GMC of Perrysburg. Deacon Ed Maher is going to share something that is, is on his heart. He's researched this subject. He speaks of it frequently. And that is, what is God saying through public and pr- approved private revelations? I think you'll find it to be very eye opening and uh, encouraging for us to really embrace this moment in history because we do believe throughout all of history, it was always a significant moment, but perhaps never before have we seen such an alignment of what God is saying through private revelation applicable to us today. He's going to speak about that March 17th, Belief in Beverage Nights, where you can register as massimpact.us forward slash B-N-B. And I have to say that I, if this entices anybody the good German-Polish girl that I am, Mm. make a pretty mean Irish soda bread. (laughs) Are you doing that? So I'm going to commit to bringing some to Belief in Beverages for St. Paddy's Day. Good for you. And last but not least, commercial tonight before we get on with our main entree. I'm sure Father wouldn't mind that we refer to him in food terms. <laughs> He'd actually our main be quite course. Honored, He'd be delighted, anyways. Um, is a new thing we have called Kingdom Builders. These are uh, Catholic business owners in our community who exhibit professional excellence and they're committed to building the kingdom. As a general comment, we'd love to go into depth on each one. We're just going to list them off in a second. But I have to say, almost all of them, Stephanie. Stephanie and I subscribe to we are clients of, and we are deeply blessed by their love of Christ, by the way in which their values translate into those whom they serve. So you can find them out, and we encourage you to to check them out, if you will, at massimpact.us forward slash kingdom. That's massimpact.us forward slash kingdom. And Steph, let's just alternate the names here. Okay, we thank All in One Payroll with Sherry Glenneman. Archibald Furniture Company with Pat and Patty McNamara. Becoming Gift. Andrew Reinhardt. Carpets by Otto with Otto and D. Wyke. Caruth Studio with Terry Langendurfer. 
Cronin Auto Family with Rich and Connie Cronin. Interstate Commercial Glass, Walt and Liz Erickson. Isabel Financial Services with Dennis Isabel. MFC Products, Paul Miller. And we have to shout out to Joan, his sure. wife. We're including wives yes. here predominantly. It's the husband, but except with one exception. But anyways, McCartney Coaching with Mike and Molly McCartney. Resourcements, Jeff Barefoot. Rob Holer, Key Realty. Quarry Hawk Medical, Bill Noltner. Signature Associates with Megan Malszewski. SJS Investment Services, Kevin Kelly. Turning Point Chiropractic with the eminent doctors, Jeff and Rachel Elmore. And Westgate Insurance Agency with Stephen Malszewski. And we just thank them for their support of our ministry and are very, very grateful for the witness that they are. Check them out and check out this whole uh, mission of uniting companies who are committed to professional excellence and building the kingdom. We want to be an occasion of support and encourage for them. Again, go to Mass Impact. Impact.us forward slash kingdom. All right, Steph, so let's give Father Eric a call. And here we go tonight on Ignite Radio Live with Greg and Stephanie Schleter. Hello, hello. Hello, Father Eric. How are you? It is the Schleters and the rest of the whole hello. listening audience. <laughs> Thousands. Embodied by my mom and dad, maybe tonight. <laughs> and your mom and dad, maybe tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, dear Father Eric? Well, I am doing well. I am doing well. Sad that we couldn't gather in person for this uh, this whole talk, but you know. I know. What the heck? Do you know? Okay, listening audience, do you know how hard it is to get the infamous Father Eric Schild like, to be available and all that fun stuff? And it finally <laughs> happens, and the forces of nature worked against us, It's Father. like trying to get Pope Benedict. No, it's like trying to get Pope John Paul II. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, yep. Indeed. No, we love you, and we are so grateful and blessed by... It's not just busyness. You are building. It's a, it's buildingness. <laughs> I'm making up my own word. It's building word. the kingdom, Go and so that. we are so grateful for you and your priesthood and your zeal for souls and um, just the energy that the Lord has blessed you with in in reaching His children, His church, and you rock. Father, I have to say, I set this up tonight, introduced you as the coming main entree. We thought you'd get a kick out of that. (laughs) So we can just, you know, keep talking about you and affirm you, and you can just sit back, or we can actually, like, listen to what you have to share with us. Indeed. I love a good entree. (laughs) Uh, You know, so that's (laughs) that's part of the, the craziness here in Maumee. People love to have their priests over for dinner uh, and they always make wonderful entrees. So without I'm going to put you on the spot here because I know everything you've had has been like a beatific vision in culinary form. I I know that that is the case but if there's one item that stands out again all of them have been awesome just on the spot question is there one uh, item you've had recently that is just amazing? So you know I always love a good steak mm. you know but it can't be an overdone steak absolutely I'm, I'm not picky, i know right I, but you know that's the problem if it starts to be overdone forget like it a hockey puck yes <laughs> you know? medium rare is the way to go please tell me you have your steak medium rare how about rare it is definitely a medium rare yes it's definitely medium rare so i i would not want to disappoint you greg <laughs> well. well we want the main the main entree eating the right entrees so i mean that that's really fab and what would you you pair that with beverage wise your preference well i mean there you know there's always a good manhattan that can go with anything always don't even need that. I mean, that, that doesn't need to be paired it just needs to, you know, <laughs> could be the entree heck <laughs> yeah that could be it and uh you know and a nice red wine that, that that's all i need so father as we were um thinking about a little intro for you um, I'm not going to embarrass you quite yet, but on a serious note... Have we already embarrassed him? Not at all. He is such That's a dear friend. Say, it I, takes I, a I lot to embarrass. I said the other day, by the way, they said the thing that they, they love about me is that I... I can't be embarrassed because I really just don't care. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> that's good. And it's good that they love that about you. So I am who I am and that's what you're going to get. And, 
So it's, it's hard to embarrass me, Stephanie, but I am always up for the challenge. Well, I won't embarrass you. Well, we got to talk about closings last Thursday during the sleet and storm, because Father being of such a delicate nature that he is. I think fragile is the word <laughs> fragile he Fragile is use. absolutely the, the word. You have to tell what happened with that right well, after we canceled. And we agreed. So in, in the front end, I will minimize the embarrassment and say we share it because we agreed with the right judgment of, of canceling belief in beverages nights. However, Steph. So I went on whatever news page just to check out other cancellations and there was one listed <laughs> and it said St. Joseph Mommy, all parish activities and I was like go Father Eric <laughs> of the hundreds and hundreds of organizations she goes to a site expecting a long list one solitary match hey but Father not everybody he's, can be a prophet he's prophetic that's what I was going to say so obviously there were many more to follow so you have always been a leader Father what I wanted to say Father Eric my dear friend is I believe, as I think back, when we met nine years ago, I think it was nine years ago this past month, um, you, I believe, were the first priest from the Diocese of Toledo that I met. Hmm. Well, there's nowhere to go but up after that. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I was going to say, good Lord. (laughs) No, but I just remember when I met you, we were were touring Cardinal Stritch, looking at it as an option for our daughter Annie, which is where um, we were blessed to be, and uh, just very um, taken by your warmth and hospitality and empathy (laughs) for this great move um, that we were embarking on, and knowing how hard it was for me to leave my family and hometown of 42 years. And so we love to claim the scripture, Revelations 12, 11, that they defeated the enemy by the blood of the lamb, our holy mass, and by the word of their testimony. We know you have not always been the specimen of a saint that we see here today in front of us. No, um, but just uh, your testimony and how the Lord has worked in your life and brought you um, where you are today. Sure, absolutely. No, I'd love to. Uh, You know, I I grew up in in Norwalk, Ohio at St. Paul, and I was blessed, um, you know, to have two parents who sacrificed to send me to the Catholic school there. And, uh, you know, my parents, good, you know, good Catholic folk and all that. And I also had an uncle who was a priest. Uh, awesome. Father Tony Borgia, who uh, passed mm-hmm. away about three years ago mm-hmm. from a heart attack. And so I was around priests and I was, you know, we always had multiple priests up at uh, Norwalk St. Paul, you know, and, and, and what was awesome was I was always struck by, uh, for the most part, uh, as I look at most of them, um, their joy, their love mm-hmm. of the people of God, um, you know, and, 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 and how they kind of welcomed me. And this is going to be part of, you know, we talk about it as making missionary disciples you know again this was they you know i back when when i was in high school the uh the rectory and the offices the parish offices were all one Mm. and so i would leave school um to go over and hang out with the parish secretary and the priests and all this type of stuff and what was great was i got out of school to do that but everybody said Oh, he's probably going to be a priest anyway, so just let him go. I, <laughs> I, I took full advantage of that. Uh, and probably, of course you probably did. spent a little bit more time in purgatory uh, for taking <laughs> that full advantage uh, of it. But, you know, as I grew up, I was blessed to be around, um, you know, parents who certainly had a love for Christ, which not everybody has that mm-hmm. uh, these days, mm-hmm. and, uh, unfortunately. And also, um, you know, great priests and great people in the parish. Mm -hmm. Uh, And these priests got me involved, you know? And I really began to develop uh, a deep love for Christ as I got involved as an altar server, you know? I still remember, Mm -hmm. you know, just the... I, when I got to ring the bell for the first time, I was in pure heaven. That's it awesome. Was like, I can ring those altar bells and ring a ding ding. That was just absolutely <laughs> fantastic, you know. Uh, but being struck by like the, the Eucharistic devotion, mm-hmm. forty hours devotion there, and you know all these different things, and then to be supported, you know, by the parish, who random people would come up to me and go, have you thought about being a priest? You'd be a good priest. And, mm. you know, at that point, I wasn't thinking priesthood. I was thinking, boy, I could do this, that, or the other thing. And I had my idea of being uh, married and, you know, having the, you know, American dream and all that type mm. of stuff. And all these people would come up to me and be like, man, would you, what, Eric, what about priesthood? About priesthood? I thought these people are all ganging up on me. <laughs> you know, these people are all ganging up. Like, what are you people talking to each other? You know, what, what's going on with that? But it really was this beautiful sense of what 
we're called to do as Catholics, and that is to invite others into relationship with Christ Mm -hmm. um, and to exude that joy uh, of the gospel, as Pope Francis talked about Mm -hmm. in Evangelii Gaudium, Mm -hmm. you know, and and they did that well in Norwalk. Mm -hmm. They did it so well, and I still to this day have such great admiration for those people um, and great gratitude because I really think they helped me to discover, first and foremost, my relationship with Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, that vocation to the priesthood. Um, and and so I'm forever going to be grateful, you know, to them. And then from there, you know, have just had some wonderful experiences that have helped me to continue to fall in love with our Lord. Um, tech retreats, Teens mm-hmm. Encounter Christ, started that in high school, have been doing that for 20-some years now, mm-hmm. you know. Amazing. And, yeah, it's just amazing, you know, to be with our uh, to, to, to be with our young people on that, to see them impacted by our Lord. Uh, and that impacts me, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and it makes me fall more in love with him. So, again, so many, um, so many awesome things, you know, but it all started back in little Norwalk, Ohio, um, you know, with my parents sacrificing to send me to the Catholic school. And even like my football coach, <laughs> you know, was super supportive of me being a priest, That's awesome. you know, and I Great. just thought. You know, that type of thing, man, did that go a long way. Mm -hmm. I direct people very often. I love our own parish and many other parishes. But for those maybe who have been away from the church for a while, I just want to say this. If you're listening right now, you switched over from Van Halen and Led Zeppelin. Love those tunes also. But uh, if if you have a hunger in your heart to know Christ more deeply and you have Catholic in your roots or you're open to it, um, certainly any parish, but I can't say strongly enough, check out St. Joe's and Maumee and uh, and Father Schild. So, you know, no further ado, we're going to kind of be folksy about this, Father. This, of course, uh, was the first Belief in Beverages talk uh, that did not happen last Thursday. And so we're very blessed to just kind of hear you uh, share a little bit about what's on your heart and how consequential it is for we as Catholics and maybe those who aren't believers to really understand, you know, what is a disciple? much less a missionary disciple, and why right now, you know, in our lives, in this moment in history, you know, is it so important, especially at the onset of Lent? So the table is set, the entree is there, go. Well, you know, I was struck by this book by Curtis Martin. Um, And, you know, I have to be honest with you, you know, I'm the guy who starts a million books and I don't finish one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's just, that's not, that's not one of my my greatest uh, characteristics, but it's just reality. Hmm. And this little book, now thank God it's a little book, um, <laughs> I, I read through that thing and just ate it all up. Mm. Um, Curtis Martin, I think uh, most people hopefully know that he founded uh, Focus. Uh, and, you know, this is the model that he uses or has used uh, and continues to use with his Focus missionaries, which are college campus missionaries that try to evangelize, be missionary disciples, and make more missionary disciples mm. out of college students, you know? And I was just so struck because it was such a simple message, but it's simple because it was what Jesus used, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, we shouldn't be like, you know, as Curtis said, it's like, this isn't something I dreamt up. This is, Mm. you know, the master dreamt this up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's why it's so effective. But then you couple this with the fact that, you know, what's the, what's the story that you hear at least up in these parts in the Catholic church, we hear decline we Mm. hear closures we hear merging we hear schools getting smaller we hear you know a lot of gloom and doom Mm -hmm. and you know at some point it's like do we just accept that Mm -hmm. you know and 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 i've been one as a priest who just frankly does not want to accept that praise Um, god and i don't i don't think we need to accept that um, yes, there's demographics that they are. Yes, there's, you know, people, the birth rates down, all these different things. There's still, there's still tons of people that are not disciples. Mm-hmm. And if we, you know, if we had a small fraction of them, we'd be filling our churches a heck of a lot more than yeah. we are, right. you know? But do we, do we take that? that call, go and make disciples of all nations, 
do we take that to heart? And I think as Catholics, and this isn't an indictment on any specific person, but I think Catholics in general are really bad at it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Indict away, Father. Indict away. We've, you know, we have, we've very much kind of, this is a priest thing to do. It's up to the priests and Mm -hmm. it's the bishops. I'll go to Mass on the weekend and I'll fulfill that obligation and boom, you know, and now it doesn't even make a difference if we fulfill that obligation in many people's minds, you mm-hmm. know? And so, again, this whole sense of, like, but yet, then if a, a church closes, people get ticked off at the bishop. Mm. Well, is there, maybe there's a reason why people weren't coming. Maybe, maybe you didn't invite anyone in. Mm. Maybe you didn't witness joy, the joy of the gospel in your life. Maybe your hypocrisy turned a heck of a lot of people away. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these different things are so, so many opportunities um, to evangelize, to make missionary disciples. But all that can only come if we're a disciple ourselves. And I think that's the interesting thing with, you know, ultimately, Curtis Martin goes, you know, the, the is kind of third phase of missionary discipleship is spiritual multiplication. Like we need to, we need to multiply disciples. That's what Jesus had in mind for mm-hmm. all of us because of our common baptism. Like get out there, you know? Um, and we do that a lot through our joy. I'm always amazed the the, the uh, conversations I can get in with people uh, at Dale's bar. in <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's amazing. You know, and here's this woman who comes up. She sees me walking down the because I live right down from there, walking to the church, and she comes up and she goes, "I need a, I need prayers for forgiveness." And so, mm-hmm. on the in the middle of Dale's Bar patio, we prayed for forgiveness. Awesome. For her. Um, you know, awesome. not only for you know the past stuff, but also I think for probably a day of heavy drinking. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's another story. You know, but um, God love her. Uh, but you know, the, the power of praying with someone yes and joy you know? as you said and if i could just interrupt you for a second father yeah. um re- recently greg and i were at a meeting with a couple different priests i won't say where i won't even say if it was local or elsewhere but it was just a heavier um atmosphere and nothing you know bad or anything like that but it was kind of that ho-hum status quo um very uh, much mediocrity you know, feel. And then um, on our drive back, we had a phone call with a priest from elsewhere. And he answered the phone with such joy. And in the midst of a conversation, which was actually about some tougher stuff, he was so joy filled. (laughs) And when we hung up with him, I was like, wow, what a contrast. What a contrast. That virtue, that gift of joy makes such a difference in regards to the faith, in regards to witnessing to the others. And dare I say, even as an encouragement for those who are already, you know, trying to to be in there evangelizing and making missionary disciples. So I just want to underscore and um, just woohoo to that gift of joy that is so important and that does make a difference. And it it really is a true test, I think, of authenticity. I I completely agree with you. And I, we were, you know, we've had a couple of priests uh, that have decided to leave uh, Mm -hmm. the priesthood here Mm -hmm. lately in our diocese. And one who is 25 years a priest and one is 10 years uh, Mm -hmm. a priest. And they decided to, they discerned that they just, that they should leave the priesthood. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I, I don't know all the reasons I have no idea, Mm -hmm. but you know, you can, we can get so kind of bogged down and, whether it's church politics or what this post or this bishop said or this, you know, or this policy or this, and that can really distract us from joy. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's not just in church world. We can get distracted by our politics. Uh, We can get distracted by COVID. Uh, We can get distracted by all sorts of different things that some of them we can't even control. And it can literally suck the joy right out of Mm. us. And if we get the joy sucked out of us, 
good luck on being missionary disciples. Indeed. Yeah, there are at least two significant moments in the past couple years that I was very blessed to share with you happened to be at the same time, same place. One was at Damascus after some evening where they really opened the floodgates. And for those who are listening, I want to punctuate this in the fullness of the Catholic faith. They followed and were and have a heart for truth revealed by our church. What God's design for us is to know him intimately. And there was a, a, an evening experience that involved that relational encounter in the presence of Jesus. And it was very powerful. And the next day, you know, the kids were doing whatever. I happened to be there for a week, hanging out, working, uh, interacting. And I remember just sitting in chairs and you'd already had some powerful experiences through various organizations. And you said there was something really powerful that happened. I could see, you know, we, we had navigated beyond kind of our, a jovial joking place. And your words really kind of struck me of like a wow factor. And then I want to add to that uh, around the same time we went to an encounter conference, uh, a summer intensive, where essentially Catholics are uh, being formed and trained to understand this realm of what does it mean to be alive in the spirit? And not just as an adjective or for a certain personality type, but, you know, essentially, what does it mean to be Catholic and open to the fullness? So I want to ask you a question. With both of those experiences, which I suspect are somewhat similar, what is the opportunity there? Because you said, at least in one of those instances, every priest, every lay person needs to experience this. So what's the opportunity there? And then getting candid, what do you think stands in the way or what, what might keep us stubborn or resistant to this tremendous gift? You know, and I, I've always found this even, I mean, I, I think sometimes even among priests, uh, you know, and, and, and even beyond just, you know, lay people, you know, do we really, do we honestly believe that God listens to and answers our prayers? Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, I mean, again, of course, any Catholic is going to say, well, yeah, I pray and I, you know, yeah, I'll pray for you. Yeah, that's, you know, good. And, and you know, but when rubber meets the road, do, do we really believe that when we pray with somebody that God, you know, through the, that can, can work through us, with us, mm. in us, you know, to, 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 to give people what they need. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that we honestly, are, that our prayers are answered? Do we honestly believe and pray like we actually do believe that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think part of it is there's a fear thing because, you know, it's like, well, what, what if God doesn't do his thing? <laughs> You're right, exactly. Mm -hmm. what, what if my, I don't know, like, oh my gosh. And even beyond just that, there's the fear of if I honestly fully give myself over to our Lord, if I honestly surrender myself, my, you know, like mm. if I give myself over to him, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely. Oh. Right. Right. So I think there's a lot of fear. I think, I think there's even a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of doubt. There's a little, there's a little bit of um, St. Peter in all of us, you know, that we think as human beings do the, the gospel reading for today mm -hmm. uh, and, and not as God does. Right. And I think that's a real, I think that's a real problem. And I think something like um, the encounter conference that I uh, experienced or Damascus, one of the things that really strikes me about uh, those types of things, they, 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 they pray, they, they pray and you know that they believe what they're, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you, know, right. Right. you know that they have the utmost faith in the Lord that he is going to provide what is needed at that time and beyond. Amen. Period. Hands down. Simple. Amen. There was an instance... Yeah, as I say, there was an instance or a moment at one of these events um, where we were being formed to not simply pray for somebody or even with somebody, but again, guided by the heart of the Father who loves us and is always working. Whether there's healing or not, he's being manifest. The ultimate healing is conversion, of course. It's eternity with him, but he wants to manifest signs and wonders. This is Catholic teaching, by the way. And uh, and, and the point was made, um, how often do we say, Lord, uh, do you want to use me to actually, on the spot, pray over somebody? And they invited somebody to come forward who had never done this before, who had never prayed 
over somebody and then they invited somebody, you know, this is a group of a few hundred. Is, is there any of you who have a measurable ailment, a measurable physical ailment that you could say on a scale of zero to 10 is more than a five is pretty significant and pretty chronic. And they brought up both of these people on, on stage. And it wasn't a showy thing, by the way. It was a context of just, God, you're here. You want to work. And they kind of formed us a little bit, again, with biblical uh, understanding, solid Catholic teaching of how to approach this and, and uh, a little bit of a, I want to say a process. It wasn't a formula. And it was amazing to everybody who was there, you and I and Father McBath were in the room, to see this person who never prayed over somebody before. It, it was two or three times literally a complete recovery from a 10 pain or eight, eight not 10, but eight, eight or seven or eight pain from hip and whatever it was. She limped up on stage to be absolutely completely healed on the spot. And I think, you know, to, to punctuate what you're saying, is that going to happen every time? No. Is that going to happen no. most of the time? No, but I can guarantee it was etched in our hearts and minds that God is not just uh, one who wants to engage us ritualistically or just, so to speak, externally through religion. But the heart of those is this relationship that he wants to work through us. How did that hit you? Sure. Oh, I, I mean, the same way. And you, you get that sense that, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know God is still working, you know, and you see that and you can't argue with that because the person had this type of pain and then didn't. Mm-hmm. Like, how right. do you explain that? Right. Besides the fact that our Lord was working, uh, you know, uh, through those prayers. So, again, I, I think, um, but I do think that to your average kind of, uh, you know, Joe Schmo in the pew, I, I, and, and, and even beyond the average Joe Schmo in the pew, maybe that some of the, the more active people, I don't know that we always kind of trust that that actually can work. So then you shy away from it or we're just uncomfortable with it because we've never been asked to do that or never been, you know, kind of taken through that process. So I think that's the other piece of that kind of, how do I even, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to pray. That's for the priest Mm. to do that. You know, how many times do I hear, well, father, I mean, you, you do the prayer because you're, you know, you're the priest. You can, you can, you, you can Mm. pray too. (laughs) Right. Right. You know, it's not for the priest. Uh, you know, we can, we can all pray. Uh, but that that sense of things, I think, is is um, you know a bit lost on people, mm-hmm. and I, I think that's um, even just when somebody says, you know, hey, can you pray for you know for you know my great aunt who's going through a cancer treatment, and we say, oh yeah 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 yeah, well, sure I'll, I'll pray for mm-hmm. it, and then maybe we remember that night, maybe we don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what if we actually stop there in the middle of Walmart and pray? Amazing. Yep, exactly. And the witness to that person, mm. mm-hmm. the fact that we truly, honestly believe that you know the Lord hears and answers our prayers, and darn it, we're gonna we're gonna do that. I mean that that impacts people in huge ways. Uh, you know, good friend of mine uh, and, and yours, Father Jeff McBeth. You know, here we were out, and Jeff can be more of a you know introverted guy mm-hmm. and, and all that, hysterical, but certainly more introverted than. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we were out to, to dinner one night, and he just looked at the, the, the server, and we are getting ready to leave, and he said, how can I pray for you tonight? That's awesome. Amen. And yep. she visibly was like, my daughter is going through this rough time right now. And he just stopped, and we prayed with her for her daughter. Mm-hmm. And this woman was visibly moved and touched by that simple act. Right, which we can all do, which we can all do. Steph, just the impact that that can have on people. And yeah, you know, I mean, it just, I'm amazed at, um, and saddens, and I would include us in this too, because we certainly fall far from the mark. But the missed opportunities when we are out at those Walmarts are all, or, or out at, you know, lunch or dinner or whatever, you know, even, you know, saying grace before meals, which hopefully we do while we're out and a, our waitress comes up, how easy would it be just to be like, hey, we're getting ready to pray. Is there anything we can pray for? You know, or as Father Jeff did so beautifully on the way out. And that, I mean, it still can be uncomfortable, right? You're still, <laughs> you know, like we just, I guess, need to normalize it. And the more that we can do it and do it together, um, 
the greater the blessing, the greater opportunity mm-hmm. that we have to bring Christ to the world. And boy, is the world mm-hmm. in need of Christ. To punctuate that, we've been blessed to interview John Michael Talbot three times and really have built kind of a neat relationship. And so here's a man many know in the 70s and 80s. I think he's still applicable now. But anyways, has written over 50 books. His music has been chart topping music. He's really kind of an icon, if you will, of the early contemporary Christian music industry and continues. He started a community uh, a Catholic community and uh, just really a remarkable, wise um, man. Anyways, he said, you know, Greg, I- I'm going to be honest with you. And he's getting up there in years a little bit. And he's mindful of this. He's pouring himself out. He said, I'm really becoming aware w- with a little bit of godly fear of the opportunities that I have missed. Mm. The opportunities that I have missed, given that God gives me every moment of my life, he holds me in existence kind of the C.S. Lewis, every person that I come into contact with is an occasion to lead closer to uh, or I'll lead further away, allow to go further away from Christ. I have a question for you if this isn't off-roading too much, Father, and if it is, you just bring us right back to um, whatever it is you might want to share about this theme in Curtis Martin's book. But the question is, as a pastor, and I see this happening, but I want to ask you, as a pastor, paint a picture of what a community of missionary disciples looks like anchored in a parish. What are its qualities or attributes? What would you like to see out of your parish five years from now as a result of you and your team attending to uh, your purpose? Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's the, um, I mean, it is the result of, uh, it'd be the result of having more disciples being made. Um, Because again, I think part of what's happened with parishes is we've seen it grow smaller and smaller uh, in different places throughout the Catholic Church, you know, is that lack of missionary discipleship. So people get very uh, closed in on themselves, mm. you know, and again, it even, it, and this is even in, in the simplest of way, you know, you have your, you know, the men's group at the parish or the women's group, and they've been meeting for, you know, uh, forever, and they have a way of doing it, and, and all of a sudden, a new person volunteers to come in, and they mm. say, oh my gosh, this is great, <laughs> and they come in, and, you know, and they, we, we had this happen at one, uh, one parish I used to be at. You know, and, and, and the, this, this younger woman volunteered to be the president of the group. And she got the, she got the, pre- the presidency and, and uh, she made a change. And all of a sudden, the previous president, who had been president since like, you know, the 1800s, <laughs> uh, said, took back over. Took back over, oh, kicked mm. her out. Wow. Uh, of the, the <laughs> Anarchy. And said, oh, I, I can do another term. I can do another term. Wow. You know, and so, you know, again, there's that sense of do we, are we, uh, can we open ourselves, uh, you know, to more people, uh, even to the people who are in the, just in the parish, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because, again, we do have impact on other people. And so, but if we don't reach out to them, if we don't include them, if we don't, you know, help them to plug in, if we don't have a sense of hospitality, mm-hmm. you know, uh, at St. Joe's and Mommy, our, our tagline is engage, encounter, and transform. If we don't engage people, we're likely never going to get them to the possibility of encountering Christ. Mm-hmm which then means that they likely are never going to be transformed on their journey to heaven. Mm -hmm. And they might not even realize they're on a journey to heaven. They might be on a journey somewhere else. (laughs) (laughs) You know, but there's that sense that I think for a parish, I mean, and and the Catholic church can be bad at this. And this is what I've always said. We can learn from, you know, the big uh, Mm non-denominational mega churches Mm -hmm. got a great sense of hospitality. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that I want, you know, people bringing their Mountain Dew and sitting it in the pew. Thank goodness. Thank you. (laughs) Although I do like Mountain Dew for the record. (laughs) But, (laughs) But you know, again, it's remarkable how radical hospitality going out of our comfort zone to help people to feel welcome because if they don't feel welcome they're not going to stay they're not going to come back Mm -hmm. and then we miss the opportunity for them to encounter christ in our sacraments uh and then 
they miss that opportunity to be transformed on that journey to heaven. Mm. And people just long also, for that. People just long for that do. welcome, to feel a part of, to feel welcomed. And I don't mean in a cheesy way, right? I mean, I mean oh. sincere. Um, you know, we've experienced people... Um, who you can just tell are searching and longing for and you know they come in and co- go out and just missed and again another missed opportunity but you the difference that it can make just going up and you know welcoming and asking questions and introducing yourself and inviting them to different things and um yeah, we're just so too often, I think, you know, punch in, punch out Catholics, right? You know, going to mass, doing our thing, you know, and I get a lot of times, I mean, again, we have six children and have been in that activity world where we had to get someone to work or had to get someone here or there. Or we had company coming. And so, you know, had to kind of after mass rush out and didn't have time to kind of hang out and talk and whatever. Certainly those things happen for people. But wouldn't it be great to make Sundays that priority in our parish to to just schedule in that time to connect after mass to you know have the conversations and not just stay in your little groups right which we all enjoy (laughs) you know catching up with people that we know well or connecting on those different levels but those people who are just kind of meandering and you know again you can tell looking for some sort of connection and so often it is that small invite that makes the biggest difference in their life on on my favorite sunday of the month which is donut sunday (laughs) uh, i always tell people people, go grab a donut but don't do the grab and go Mm. this is not a grab and go thing Mm. if you're going to take a donut introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know Mm -hmm. that's so good introduce yourself to somebody you don't know but you know this is also just i think um part of how we think has to be different Hmm. uh, now in the church. There's a great book out there uh, from Christendom to the Apostolic Age. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's out of the University of Mary. And uh, wow. I mean, and it's so very powerful. We are operating like we're in Christendom. What was Christendom like? Well, Christendom was when everybody just came to Mass. Everybody, you know, they, they paid, they prayed, they obeyed, they did what, you know, the, the government pretty largely was uh, in favor of kind of the ideals that us Christians espoused, you know, mm-hmm. uh, at that point, you weren't dealing with gay marriage, or you weren't dealing with any mm-hmm. of these different things, you were, you know, it was, it was they were largely kind of, uh, they enforced what, what we kind of believed. And, you know, this is back in the day where you know, it was good old days where priests got out of speeding tickets and, you know, all <laughs> these different things, you know. And uh, but, but again, it was easy. It was mm-hmm. easy to be Christian. We built huge churches and institutions, and the institution uh, swelled in size. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. institution was healthy and strong, and it was robust, and it was, you know, and we're still operating like that. Yeah what we're in but i i forget i don't know if it was was paul the sixth uh said christendom is dead Mm -hmm. you know and meaning now the apostolic age what happened to the apostles well there wasn't an institution to back them up right Um, right i mean big powerful institution they were few in number uh they had to fight like hell in order to you know to, to to carry on the faith to the point of typically being martyred you know and their faith was super strong, whereas in Christendom, faith kind of decreased because it was easy. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, we still operate like we're in Christendom, you know? Well, you know, um, our parish offices are going to be open from 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. You better get there if you want to mm. get there. <laughs> so I find Friday myself... Start. Go ahead. Sorry if you work. I mean, I don't, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. Uh, you know, it's like, well, they should just they should just figure it out. Well, uh, not so much, <laughs> not so much. You know, or again, we don't need to be attentive to good hospitality or good music or you know, good you know, preaching or what. Well, they should just come. Well, yeah, maybe they should, but they're not. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, 
Yeah, I, f- I find what's decisive, and it, it wouldn't be an interview with Greg and Steph if there weren't hardball questions. And I do say, I ask myself these questions. What's at the heart of this? What is at the heart of people who have been sacramentalized and even who go to church? Um, and, and I think it's a distinction really between formula and faith. If it's just formula, like one should do these things, it's going to fade. And I would pose the question this way, and I, and I invite my, you know, all of us to look in the mirror and sincerely ask this, and I invite you to speak into it. It's simply this. If we're not authentically, joyfully, naturally evangelizing, bringing the love of Christ to others, seeing them with the Father's heart, being able to pray for them, invite them, let them know Christ, it's likely that we ourselves have not been evangelized or we're not living in the light of of what it means because nobody had a problem a couple Sundays ago at the Super Bowl uh, if their team was winning or losing expressing that that heartfelt connection it wasn't a personality type you know if you love something it evokes a new motive it evokes a new desire for others to experience it in the case of something very positive so I want to ask you the question maybe are, are we missing what it really means to know Jesus. Like, do we really know Jesus or just know about Jesus? What's the difference and how do we get from knowing about Jesus to truly, and it's going to be a life of of eternally more fully knowing him. I get that, but to get on the path of a life of knowing Jesus, speak to that. Um, I think you're, I think you're right on. I, um, I had a, uh, actually a woman stopped me after mass today and she was lamenting, we've been doing this um, return, uh, uh, book return about uh, how to get my kids or grandkids or anyone who's fallen away from the church back. And uh, it's a fantastic book by uh, Brandon. I think it's called Vote as it's mm-hmm. uh, G-O-G-T. Great book and I thoroughly recommend it. And so many people are, are in that situation. And, and, you know, and she said, well, I sent my kids to Catholic schools and how could it be that, mm-hmm. you know, that they are, that they've fallen away, you know? And I, I said exactly what you just said, Greg. And that is the fact that, you know, a lot of people know about him, but they don't really know him. And then the problem is if you, if you only just know about the man, and you don't really know him, um, then how will you ever get to the point of sacrificing for him, mm. of going against, you know, what our culture says you should do, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, I mean, truly of sacrificing. Well, you don't. You don't. So, you know, I, I uh, we've really started to take on a different approach, like in our Catholic school and just in our in our parish and different things like that, as far as um, you know, giving people not only the the religious instruction mm-hmm. about Jesus Christ, but also, you know, I, I I mean, I have all of my kids in my school going to Damascus in mm. sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. You know, where they encounter Jesus Christ, the mm-hmm. Son of God. Mm-hmm. How has that been for them? They, How is that? What has it done for them? Like, explain for our audience. You know, for folks, by the way, Damascus.org or CYC.com, you can see what's happening there. Our son, you hear us talk about that, Damascus worship, whatever. But Father, as a pastor, explain the difference that you see from kids who go there, and what do you understand happened there? And thirdly, maybe, how can we do that in our parishes? Sure. Yeah, they. I mean, kids genuinely go there, and they, they will tell me, you know, I, I know Jesus loves me. Hmm. You know, they, they experience that. They know it. Um, you can tell that by the way they pray, uh, you know, mm. all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it becomes, um, you know, it used to be where, man, if I'm praying, if I'm singing, if I'm worshiping, that's, uh, that's embarrassing because people might make fun of me all of a sudden they are just, they're, 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 they're giving it their all and they're mm. all Beautiful. into that, you know, but then we're also seeing it in ways, you know, we started a middle school youth group this year and it's not uh obligatory you just if you want to come on a thursday night you can and you know these these kids we, we're getting 70 80 kids amazing school. awesome you know and but again i think a lot of that is credited with the fact that you know they that they, they, they've started to develop a true relationship with our lord mm. so they want to be engaged in that mm-hmm. you know again it's no different than a human relationship and that you know when we get to know and love somebody we want to spend more time with them 
you know, we want to waste time with them. Um, you know, that's what, you know, married couples do mm-hmm. when they love each other. Oh, they just want to, they're, they're good with just simply wasting time with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and so, um, again, I think that is, um, I, I've seen it. I, I'm convinced of it. There's many great examples of it, but I think some of these retreat type of experiences are so helpful mm-hmm. because it gets kids and adults out of their ordinary away from their phone, away from the TV, away from the things that distract us, uh, and truly help us to, to, to be put in a position where we can actually focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know? Amen. So that's, I think, what parishes can also do is create opportunities for people, yes, to study. And, you know, Bible studies are fantastic. And, you know, different, you know, book studies or, you know, again, ways that we teach but also how do we continue to give people experiences of Jesus Christ? Hmm. And sometimes, you know, the, the mass isn't necessarily the, the best way to evangelize mm-hmm. the, uh, the incoming person. Absolutely. Uh, right, it's right. beautiful to somebody who understands it, but it can be a little frustrating to somebody who doesn't. Mm-hmm. You know, so we've started these um, encounter nights of worship. You know, again, you, you have the Eucharist there. Um, but if you're kind of new to all this and it's, you know, you still have great music and you have prayer opportunities and opportunities to pray with somebody, you know, these different things, but they're different experiences that touch the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think when our heart is touched, uh, by our Lord, that's when tremendous things can happen, uh, in our mind, in our soul, in our lives, Mm -hmm. um, Right, you know, right. And, so, okay. and the more and more we can provide, and St. Joe's is a great example of this, um, opportunities for encounter, right? That's when we're going to see that change happen. Um, you mentioned the, you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders going to Damascus. I'm sure, and we've seen it from our involvement in Damascus, but those kids then come home and make an impact in their families. Oftentimes... Oh bringing their parents back to the faith or at least a deeper faith or kind of like, I want what they have, <laughs> you know, even though I should I'm, be the leader and here my kids are on fire. Right. Yeah. Right. And so with that, I just want to, to make a statement and then throw something back at you, father. So there's a homily that our beloved father, Adam Hertzfeld, whom we miss dearly. So how did this group of 12, which obviously multiplied, you know, reach the corners of the earth? Right. And he said it was in the early church, how that happened was in the home. Like church was in the home and not just how they, you know, what we would say celebrated mass, but that's where they learned the faith was in the home. And the home is the heart of passing along that faith of that encounter with Christ, of that practicing in that school of love. You know, we need our parishes and that is where we are fed sacramentally. And that's where, again, these wonderful opportunities of encounter happen in so many ways. But I think something that that prevents not just missionary disciples, but disciples is a real lack in the home of opportunities of encounter there, of true um, making it happen, comfort, having a vision for it, right of into that it, vision yeah. of that comfort. So, as a pastor, what would you say to parents or grandparents? How would you encourage them besides going to MassImpact.us? <laughs> plug. Um, you know, what words of encouragement would you have? Because it, it is a both and it's not an either or and they should, you know, it should flow to and from each other. So I throw that at you. Sure. Absolutely. We, we have to work on the parents and, 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 and above parents and grandparents uh, in those relationships with our Lord um, before we can expect them to really cultivate that faith within their kids and in their families. Um, and I think that's a, that's a real challenge these days. So, you know, we've started to think in terms of, okay, you know, our religious ed program isn't just an opportunity to catechize kids. It's an opportunity to evangelize their parents. Mm-hmm. You know, because, again, a lot of our parents were poorly catechized, if at all. Um, and they, they have not had those encounters with our Lord and so how do we 
formulate those encounters for parents too. Mm -hmm. Because the fortunate thing is, if our kids have a great experience and go home and are just shut down or ignored by the parents, not even out of a fault of their own, just because they don't get it, or maybe they're fearful to engage it because they feel ill-equipped. Right, right. That's real problematic. Mm -hmm. You and, know? And again, we know um, with, with our uh, experience with Damascus, sometimes the greatest fear that these kids have had isn't even, you know, embarrassment, perhaps, in a, in a, a new them, if you will, in their friend groups, but it's going back into their home where this has not been their experience. And what a tragedy, right? But also what an opportunity that the Lord will bless. Folks, you're tuned in to Ignite Radio Live. We're so blessed that you are with us tonight. And Father Eric Schild, the formidable entree, the formidable pastor of St. Joe's Maumee, speaking about missionary discipleship and based upon the book by Curtis Martin. We encourage you to check that out. And of course, um, a comment on this before we come in for a landing and we ask Father to close us in a prayer. We've said this before that we've never had many more opportunities with the internet access to read, to hear, to go to programs, to access these things. And we should avail ourselves to those. And they've been transformative, but it really should beg the question, how different are we in our marriages and family and world as a result? Without which we run the risk potentially of becoming Catholic program junkies instead of Catholic missionary disciples. And I truly believe the Holy Spirit always being poured out. But right now, in this moment, I believe that uh, God has attuned our heart to people in need in our own families and world. And, and just the awareness right now, brothers and sisters, think of this. If I were to say, can you think of somebody who really needs to know God's love? Well, maybe it wasn't just Greg Schleter who said this, but the Holy Spirit who used a dork like me to just invite your consideration. And then the next question is, well, how might you be called to pray for that person? Imagine the difference you could make by simply sending a text message. I'm thinking of you. I'm praying for you. All the more, hey, uh, what are you doing Thursday night? Come on over for, for supper. Um, all the more, hey, how, what, what can I pray for you for? So I encourage you to act on those promptings for us all to be all the more aware that God wants to use us to claim this kingdom. And we're so blessed that we have the sacraments and priests. We lift up our bishop. We lift up our priests. We lift up our pope. And uh, this vital occasion of being connected to Christ in communion with Jesus. You don't get more intimate than that. To be so connected to him who is the Christ, the anointed one, who doesn't just appoint us. He anoints us to do what he wants us to do, to act on his heart, to act in his love. So with that, Father, I turn the baton over to you to land us in prayer. Steph is uh, wanting to add something here. Well, I just want to give you the opportunity first, Father Eric, if there's anything else that you wanted um, to add about the book missionary disciples well there was two there was there that we only got into the spiritual multiplication but curtis martin also talks about authentic friendship and divine intimacy mm -hmm. and ultimately you know we can't get an, into authentic friendships which that's a topic for another night and we can't get to spiritual multiplication if we don't have divine intimacy with our lord and i think that's something for all of us to kind of look at deep down mm -hmm. uh, inside of ourselves and to say you know, do we have that divine intimacy with our Lord? Do we abide in Him? Because if we don't, uh, we're never going to be helpful uh, for the, the, the cause of evangelization or discipleship or, you know, anything, because we're going to be seen as hypocrites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people, if there's one thing that ruins our church, it's hypocrisy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, again, you know, look at the priest's sexual abuse scandal, you know? Mm -hmm. and again, you, you, you know, you're that these priests are living this, you know, this way, and then you see this, and you're like, oh, you know, and it, mm. and it kills. Faith, Heartbreaking. It kills, you know, all these different things. So, you know, and the biggest thing, people say, I'm not, I don't want to go to church. A bunch of hypocrites, mm -hmm. you know, and now I always say, you'll fit in well. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> because we all got a, a level of hypocrisy, mm. right? Uh, but, but boy, we're trying to minimize that, and mm -hmm. that can only come through our divine intimacy. So, mm, so you know, good. I think those. Yeah. I just want to say this um, because it's it's the core of what it means to be Christian, our unsurpassed identity, all these other things competing for identity. And it takes a little bit of uh, vulnerability, metanoia, a, a, a transparency before God to call him Abba, Father. And just three things, brothers and sisters who are listening right now, and I'm just asking you to enter into my heart as I pray this from the heart. Lord Jesus, I love you. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Lord Jesus, be my Lord. Absolutely. Good and gracious God, we are so grateful for your 
love in our life for your son uh, who continues to uh, inspire us and lead us uh, closer to you for uh, the gift of our church and our faith, our communities. Uh, and so, dear Lord, we just ask that you continue to uh, be with us, uh, help us to be divinely intimate with you so mm. that we can uh, develop into authentic friendships and most of all to uh, spiritually multiply, to bring more people closer to you as we become closer to you ourselves. These things we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless Amen. you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Folks, thank you so much for being with us tonight on Ignite Radio Live. You can hear past episodes at IgniteRadioLive.com. I think they'll be very much a blessing if you're going for a run or a long drive. I think you'll be very edified by former episodes. We do encourage you to sign up for our Belief in Beverages Nights, the third Thursday of every month. The next one, Deacon Ed Maher talking about private revelation, the Catholic moment. Find that at massimpact.us forward slash BNB. And of course, remind you again of this Power Hour series in Lent with these superstar Catholic speakers. A great date night every Wednesday, 8.30, just an hour, 8.30 to 9.30. Get your group together in your home or you can do it online, but live, powerful, impactful talks by some of our nation's uh, most formidable Catholic speakers. You can find out more, massimpact.us forward slash power. Until next time, God bless you.